Well, when I finally decided to go ahead and, and act as the CEO for our country, our choice, uh, you know, it really became unavoidable. And uh, what's, what's happened is that I now have someone who manages that account for me, and there are real restrictions in what he can what he can put there. It has to come from me. It has to be a direct quote uh, from something I've written or, or, you know, said on television or some other medium. Because I really don't want to get involved in these pointless back and forth attacks with idiots on uh, Twitter. Yeah. And I, as a general rule, uh, you know, you know me. I hate social media. Yeah. Uh, I really despise it. Uh, I. But it's unavoidable. You know, if you don't make use of it, you can't get the message out, which is really what we're interested in. Yeah. Well, could you tell me a little bit about our country, our choice, or is that uh, something that's under wraps still? No, no. It's just that we're at the beginning. Yeah. And we've had an overwhelming response. Mm-hmm. We're up to about 10,000 people who want, want to be members. And we didn't expect it. You know, we thought this would take a little longer to get started because we're not really firing on all cylinders. We're going to be located uh, in Orlando where we're trying to set up a headquarters and we're still hiring people. We have a lot of talented people. We've got a lot of people that want to work with us and for us, and we're deeply grateful for it. But uh, imagine, you know, you you know, if Noah built the ark for 50 animals and 5,000 showed up, well, we're in the 5,000 category right now, playing catch up. And what we're really really about, I think, in the, in the narrow sense, is these are these are people with traditional conservative values who are appalled at this uniparty, who are fed up with the uh, failure of the Democrats and the Republicans to really produce anything that's of importance to the American people. And the American people want to be protected. Uh, they want to live in a country where there's a rule of law. They're sick of all the criminals being released and, and then people who are not criminals being prosecuted, as we've just seen, by the way, with these uh, January 6 people, this, this fiction that there was an insurrection, which is absurd. And then on top of that, you've got uh, the problems at the border, the open borders, the endless wars. And I started to talk about these things and other issues that I mentioned about, you know, here's the poor American worker who works all of his life, and then he could look forward to $1,400 a month from Social Security, and someone enters our country illegally, is handed $2,200 a month and a ticket to wherever he or she wants to go inside our country, after which, of course, other than continuing to receive free funding for whatever it is they do, they disappear. Uh, so, you know, that, that's very upsetting to people, and, and they're tired of the sexualization of children. I mean, basically, we're talking about security for Americans first. That means also ending these pointless and self-defeating conflicts. And most Americans don't even know where Ukraine is, and if they do, they certainly don't want to fight there. And the whole war is a catastrophe. It's, it's murdered the Ukrainian nation, uh, and we're, the, we're the, you know, the, the executioners in that sense. The Russians have actually restrained themselves dramatically and held back because they're very strong. We're very much in a position to march very rapidly west, especially now where there's almost nothing out there to stop them. So I think people want to join us because they want an advocate for, for what's right. And they want a way to try and hold people in Washington accountable for all the corruption and stupidity. And they can't rely on the people they voted for. So what we want to do is, uh, first of all, we want to give people a platform where they can speak. Uh, We want to help them organize across the country against this swamp, this sort of hopeless government that we have and the corruption that it represents. And then we want to help people hold, hold these politicians accountable. Now, how do we do that? By making it clear what they really think and what they really do. I mean, a lot of these people stand up there and you think you're listening to uh, Ronald Reagan in 1982, and then they go in and behave like Karl Marx. Yeah. So th- this sort of thing has got to end. Uh, so all of those things wrapped up together is really what it, our, our country, our choice is about. Now, we're trying to stay away from some of the more divisive issues uh, because we want to unite people as much as possible. We want to focus on those things where we can agree, where we can have an impact. Uh, so I, I think that's our country, our choice for trying to build a media platform that will keep people informed, help them uh, in, on the local level, let them also uh, provide information about what's happening in their particular area. So we're going to try and ultimately pay workers, people that are part of the organization, we call them guardians, 
it will be all over the country in all of our states. And ultimately, we'd love to have somebody in every congressional district so that we get the ground truth. We find out what's really happening, and then we can also help and assist them. This is all going to take time, <clears throat> but uh, we're really overwhelmed with the positive response we've gotten. And I think uh, we're going to end up with, uh, at some point, millions of members, to be frank. Yeah, but we won't be able to accommodate that until the end of this year, November, December time frame. And then I think as we move into 2024, hopefully we'll become a real force that the political environment, you know, the people that are representing us or not representing us have to deal with. So is it a media platform or like a nonprofit uh, lobby group or how does it like? What is no, we are not a, we are not a nonprofit because we, we think if you can't pay people on the ground to advocate for the right things, you're going to fail. Right. This has been a problem on the right. If you look at the left, you go back to the 2020 election or the 2016 election, you go to any of the polling stations, there are 30, 40, 50 lawyers there bankrolled by the left to ensure that uh, things go the way the left wants them to. There's nobody there advocating for us, the American people. And I think <clears throat> I think that has to happen. So we are not a nonprofit. We're, we have investors. I think we're going to have more investors. Obviously, if people want to contribute to us, we're grateful for it. But, you know, in this time frame, we did not want to build an organization that's designed to become a movement for what's in the interest of the country and then ask people in crappy times like the ones we live in for money. I mean, we, we don't want to ask Americans who want to join us for money. We say, no, bring your, bring your energy, you know, bring your imagination, bring your ideas. And we'll do everything we can to incorporate you and maximize that. But but we're not asking anybody for money. So right. joining this is free. And as I said, uh, if you if we got to say a million plus, we would have eight thousand guardians, and these people would be the paid infrastructure that helps guide the larger movement because it's really about a movement. You know, we've had our national identity diluted through this uncontrolled immigration that is really killing us. And now we hear terrible stories about people coming in with all sorts of medical conditions and diseases. You know, we have people in Central America dying of encephalitis and malaria on the way up here. We want to put a stop to this. We're tired of hearing about little girls who are 11 years old being gang raped before they cross the border from Mexico into the United States. We want this to stop. And we want to stop the criminals inside our country. So that's these are the things we want to do. We're going to stop this stupid war in Ukraine that is killing people pointlessly. We don't want regional or global war with Russia or China or anybody else. We think we can cope with these things, but we've got to build prosperity, too. We've got to get back to the economy, secure our country, and build it up. These are the things that I think most Americans can agree upon. Do you think your military background helps you in organizing this uh, structure you're building? You call them guardians? Well, it, you know... Maybe, but uh, look, I'm, uh, th this, is, this is way beyond the military. And remember, we're not recruiting soldiers. We're just asking citizens to come on board and work with us. That's a different kettle of fish. So we're not issuing any commands. What we're doing is we're saying, oh, task number one, build membership. Task number two, let's organize ourselves into groups that are focused on specific issues that we care about, like the ones I've been discussing. And then three, once we've done those kinds of things, we need to build the larger infrastructure the country with the guardians and so forth so this is this is a, a process that's going to take some time we've got to ramp up and we're going to do that as quickly as possible but i'm not saying it's easy and i want everybody to understand that we're not trying to recruit uh, a group for a revolution if we if we're going to have a revolution we would like it to be democratic and peaceful we, we're not interested in uh, you know any any fringe groups that think they're going to change washington overnight by marching in that's nonsense it's, uh, we, we understand this is a battle that's going to take months, maybe in some cases years. We're prepared to fight it, but it's not, uh, it's, it's not about arming anybody or uh, you know, involving in violence. We're, we're all disgusted with the violence that we saw in 2020. Yeah. We want the rule of law enforced, enforce the damn laws, back the police, do whatever is required in these big cities to get control of things again. And that's not happening, and that's what we believe in. Now, uh, some folks have suggested uh, uh, for years, though, uh, besides Trump and Tucker Carlson, it's just basically you 
who are national known figures who are for a realistic foreign policy. And some have, have used that to say, uh, Colonel McGregor, would you ever be interested in, in political office down the road or at some point? And, and the answer is I am not interested in running for office. Uh, yeah. I have experience with that. I've always been very critical of people who served in the military for long periods. I, I'm not talking about someone who's in for three, four, five years, or, or even for that matter, some 20-year uh, officer who decides to retire, a senior NCO, and wants to run for office. I'm talking about senior officers, people like me, and and those who have served for you know, 25, 30, 35 years. In theory, we're professional soldiers, and I, I don't see us as as uh, ideally suited, you know, to to govern the country by any means. You know, I am very interested in the sad state of our military, and I would like to see uh, the military fundamentally stripped down, rebuilt, reorient, reoriented, and moved in new directions. That's a different matter. That's that's what I've always been about. And I'm about the foreign policy, which is is inseparable from our military, because we've militarized our foreign policy. Our answer to everything is bomb them. Yeah. You know, we bully everybody all the time. We bully them with our financial system. We sanction people, and then we invade them. This has got to end. Yeah, and it's it's one of those things that people are, are, are just so exhausted because they feel that uh, the Republican Party is completely lockstep with the Democrats. I mean, Mitch McConnell was over there saying, you know, he's proud of Biden's work with Ukraine. He's just not doing it fast enough and competent enough and giving him the money. Um, this is in stark contrast to where the base, the populist base of both the Democrat and Republican Party really is on this matter. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. representing the Democrat base, which still has a populist tinge to it and some anti-war elements. Uh, you know, it, it just seems as if their base... Their respective bases are always shut out of the political process when it comes to representation. No, I, I agree with you completely, and I think uh, very highly of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. I think he's on, absolutely on the right track. And, you know, I tell people all the time that, you know, I'm old enough to have grown up with real Democrats in the 50s and the 60s, and those people were patriots. I, I lived in an area where, you know, Republicans were about as scarce as hen's teeth, and everybody was a Democrat. But they were all patriots. They all loved the country. There, there were no differences among us between what was really vital for the nation. I mean, one of the things I tell people all the time, and they all look surprised because, you know, no, most people don't know their own history. Very few people are aware that when Richard Nixon ran against John F. Kennedy in 1960, Richard Nixon actually won the election. That election was, quote unquote, stolen. And at the time, <clears throat> Many people came to Nixon and said, you've got to protest this. This this must not stand. And he said, well, you know, we're in a difficult position right now. Right now, we, We're dealing with the Soviet Union. And in 1960, the Soviet Union loomed very large uh, and cast a terrible shadow over the United States and the free world. And he said, I don't think we want to uh, put our country at risk by internal disputes that might give aid and comfort to the Soviet opponent. Then he also said something else. He said, in addition, you know, I know uh, John F. Kennedy. I've served with him in the Senate. The man's a patriot. Our country is safe in his hands. Well, that's the point. Our country is not safe in the hands of the people in Washington at all. And I don't care whether it's Biden or McConnell or any others. These people are all focused on self-enrichment. They financialized the economy. They've subverted the democratic process and there's no real difference between the people on both sides that are dominating the scene and they're a danger to our country this has got to stop we've got to come up with a counter elite that's also what we're about identifying and building up a counter elite people that share our values our thinking and care about the country love the country and want this to change but that world that i grew up in is is truly gone and so when we look at the other people that we're dealing with, and you know, you mentioned McConnell and Biden and Schumer, look at them. What's the difference? Who are we kidding? There is no difference. That's the problem. Right. Yeah. Now, going <clears throat> to, to the war in Ukraine, I've heard you recently say that I think it was to the effect of uh, your concern that perhaps Russia's slow approach to this could make this conflict a more dragged out uh, hot war between America and 
in Russia. Is that correct? Is that, is that yeah, correct? I, I'm concerned because people have been misled from day one about the Russians. Putin, at the beginning of this uh, debacle, moved into Ukraine with a very small force, about 90,000. And this force suddenly encountered a Ukrainian army that we had built up over the previous six, seven years with the express purpose of fighting and destroying Russia. Uh, and he, he thought that he was sending a signal to the West that had not paid any attention to him that the Russians are serious about their security and they would not tolerate a NATO presence on their border. And they most of all were concerned about our willingness to put missiles into eastern Ukraine, as the Soviets did in uh, Cuba in, in the 1960s, that would threaten their cities and threaten their nuclear deterrent. There's a lot of evidence that we were absolutely prepared to do that, and that's what the Ukrainian force and the state were being built up to support. He discovered that uh, he had no negotiating partners, but he dragged this out through March and April and finally said, well, that's it. I guess no one's going to negotiate with us. We're in a different different set of circumstances. He did not, I think, expect the reckless hatred uh, that grips Washington and their globalist uh, allies in Western Europe. And as a result, he said, we're, this is a game changer. We've got to go back, reexamine things. And then the, the Russian military buildup began. And today you have over 750,000 troops. There, there are plans to go up to 1.2 million. They may well reach that by the uh, beginning of the next year. Is that total or you mean deployed into Ukraine? No, total. Total. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but, but the 750,000 right now are around Ukraine or in it. Uh -huh. And that force is enormous. And it's extremely well equipped, heavily, heavily armed, and by the way, very competent and very well led, contrary to what everybody says. They've inflicted devastating casualties. It's more than 400,000 dead Ukrainian soldiers now. How many casualties on the Ukrainian side, anybody knows. But when you look at the Russian side, you're looking at perhaps 30,000, 40,000 killed in action, maybe another 30,000, 40,000 wounded, and most of the Russian wounded is treated and returns to the battlefield to fight, whereas most of the wounded in Ukraine are so severe they'll never come back to combat. So now they're trying to basically force whatever they can find inside Ukraine into uniform to go jump jump into the meat grinder that's killing thousands of Ukrainians every week. And they're they're trying to get the Polish government to assist them in repatriating anywhere between eighty and a hundred thousand Ukrainian young men to come back and fight. Of course that's not going to happen. There are all sorts of legal reasons why that won't happen. Because remember you've had fourteen million people at least move west and leave Ukraine. So th this this organization we call a government, the Zelensky crowd, is really weak, and they are devastated, and they're on their last legs. So what what sustains them? Us. Yeah. We're, we're transferring billions in cash. We own the government. We pay for the government. We pay for the military. The whole place would fold fold and die tomorrow morning if we suspended the aid. Now the aid that they do need is medical. The aid they need is humanitarian. They don't need any military aid. This needs to stop. We need to suspend that. It's just killing more and more Ukrainians. Now, here's it, the Russians controlling 90% of the territory where the Russian population lived in eastern Ukraine that they were trying to protect. So they've got that, and they've been sitting on it, defending it. And I think there's a lot of frustration in the senior ranks of the Russian military, because I think the Russian military has been saying for months now, Let, let's attack and get this over with. We can we can crush this problem once and for all. And he's been reluctant to do that for two reasons. Number one, he really doesn't want to kill any more Ukrainians. We find that hard to believe, but he sees them as Orthodox Christian Slavs, just like the Russians. Secondly, he doesn't want the United States and NATO to intervene in Western Ukraine. So he's taken the position that let's move deliberately and incrementally to avoid a sudden impulsive move from Washington that would put them at war with us in Russia. And that's an understandable concern. But now the situation is so bad and we are so weak, I think, in the West, as he's accurately concluded. I don't think that the potential for real intervention is there anymore. If you look in Poland, pub public opinion there has swung decisively against Polish involvement in the war. Oh. They'll send assistance, but they will not fight. 
And so under those circumstances, I think his, his senior military leaders are saying, let's, let's go and end this. If we do nothing and the Europeans fail to elect new governments or put new people in power that will talk to the Russians, then I suspect he'll eventually give permission and they will march west. And they could march all the way to the Polish border. I keep telling people this. And, of course, that's the opposite of what we want. You know, the beauty of Ukraine, particularly if it had become a neutral state, was that it put 500 miles between the NATO border and the bulk of the Russian military, which is what we wanted. Now we're going to get the opposite because we were foolish and stupid and mis completely miscalculated, didn't understand the Russians, didn't understand their capabilities. Now, is it Washington's... Uh, the, the foreign policy genius Mike Pence and Nikki Haley have suggested that things are going according to plan. We need to drain a, a Russia of its resources, of its military personnel, and that's why we should be continuing this effort. And it's going according to plan in their terms, maybe just not fast enough. Like they, that's kind of a neocon talking point against Biden. <laughs> uh, well, you know, he's not he's not tough enough, right? And they're always saying that. Is anybody out there? believe anything that uh, the former vice president or this person, uh, Nikki Haley, the former governor of South Carolina, says they know nothing. These people are uninformed and ignorant of reality. They certainly don't understand what's really happening. And even if they do, it doesn't matter. You have to look at the people who are donating to them. I keep yeah. telling everybody, you want to understand why somebody says stupid things like that that make no sense that are very dangerous. Who are their donors? And this is why I, you go back to Trump. One of the things we liked about President Trump was that he put his own skin in the game. He, he was someone that said, no, I'm not going to simply do whatever the donors want. You have someone now with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. who's very similar. And naturally, both, both uh, men are widely hated and despised in Washington by the swamp because they represent a clear and present danger to the corruption. You know, it's just a big money laundering operation in Washington and the American people – are the ones whose money's disappearing, and they're not getting anything out of it. So you don't think that Putin's decision to slow walk this war is not it is not contributing to the diminishment of the Russian uh, military in a way that would uh, render the country in a much more vulnerable state going forward? No, no, not at all. <clears throat> Russian society is incredibly cohesive and very strong, and, and the backing that Putin has is phenomenal. And the military establishment is excellent, as I've told people repeatedly. Uh, you, you have to have been there in the 1980s, as I was, and seen the deterioration in the Soviet armed forces that then completely collapsed in the 90s. Then subsequently gone back, as I did in 2001, and see the new renaissance, which then was just beginning, and the attention to detail and change and reorganization that took place in the Russian military. No, this is this is a very strong, capable force, and if you challenge it, you know you're going to have a hard time. And what I've always worried about is that we stupidly challenge them, we are soundly defeated, and then in our frustration and embarrassment, we decide to turn to a nuclear weapon. Well, that's game over. And I've tried to tell people again and again and again: stop this nonsense about a quote-unquote tactical nuclear weapon. Oh. Don't worry about this one. This is only five kilotons. Uh, they'll understand that we're not serious. We're not going to go to a all-out nuclear exchange. Well, if you're sitting in Russia or China and you have an arsenal and we use a nuclear weapon, the incentive there is immediately to respond with everything you've got because you're afraid that you'll lose it if you don't. We need to stay away from this nuclear business. And both the Russians and the Chinese have said they will not use nuclear weapons unless they are attacked with nuclear weapons. Yeah. We need to stop this and get out of this business, and we need to stop fighting over it. We have no interest in, in Ukraine. East, West, center, we have none. No strategic interest. The only strategic interest we have is no more war in Europe. And that was the interest that should have guided us as soon as this became a conflict in February and, and March of uh, 2022. That's when we should have intervened right away and said, wait a minute, we don't want a war. That's not the answer. We have to talk. But you can't talk to people if you won't listen to them. Yeah. We refuse to listen to anything they say. And, of course, we say all this ridiculous nonsense, Putin is Hitler or Stalin or something else. That's not true. Now, I don't, I don't know the man personally, but I can tell you this Russia, 
bears no resemblance to those horrible states in any way, shape, or form. We need to stop talking in those terms. You know, I, I always ask people, well, what happened to the global caliphate? Yeah. Silence. Yeah. Well, you know, well, if Russia doesn't work out for us, the attitude in Washington is, well, we'll turn on China. Well, that's a great idea. Yeah. You know, why would you do such a stupid thing? And people say, well, the Chinese are this, the Chinese are that. Look, close your borders. Secure your coastal waters. Expel the people in the country from China who are stealing from you, who are here to do us harm. Throw them out. You know, let's get control of America. Let's expel these illegals. Let's restore, you know, the, the, the rule of law. These are the things we need to do. We don't need to go to war. War is the last thing we need. Well, I'm, I'm sure you're right. But their concept of one world government, I think, is one world financial domination. Yeah. Uh, if they can financially dominate everything, which is what both China and Russia and now India, the BRICS, uh, the Saudis, everyone is now backing away and saying, look, we're going to stop using dollars. Yeah. You're not going to dominate us. You're not going to control us. You're not going to manipulate us. So they've, they've clearly gotten the memo. And you have to look at the people who control finance and the media and Hollywood, and you, you begin to discover who's controlling events on the Hill. Which hedge fund managers are the big donors? Who are they? What do they want? They all want the same thing. They want to destroy Russia. Well, they want to remove Putin, and they want to essentially divide Russia up, strip it of its resources, and sell it off. Uh, that's what they want. This has nothing to do with the things that are publicly stated. This is, this is just one huge corrupt operation, and we're being exploited just as the Ukrainian people are being exploited to do it. you got to stop it. Do you think the Western oligarchs got into the ear of Prigozhin, or do you think that was just totally unrelated? Uh, no, whole... that has nothing... yeah, don't worry yeah. about Prigozhin. I, I don't know what happened with regard to his death, but you know, Prigozhin was somebody who was enormously popular. Uh, he was popular because he expressed this view that we discussed earlier. Why are we waiting around to crush these people? Why don't we just get this war over with? That was the view he was expressing, and that's widely held in the senior ranks of the Russian military. There are also a lot of people in the Russian government that feel that way. Putin is, is not anything like the person described in the Western media. He was the one Russian leader who, first of all, spent time in the West. He knew something about Western civilization. The man speaks fluent German. He spent years in Germany. This is someone who likes the West. He wants a good relationship with the West. He wants to do business with the West. He doesn't want to fight it. Uh, this is all being turned on its head by these uh, financial oligarchs in the West, as you point out. They're very dangerous, and they're not just in the West. You know, just like this man, Kolomoisky, who's now been arrested, which is a joke because he's a billionaire oligarch who picked Zelensky from nowhere and made him president of Ukraine. But of course, he was busy laundering billions of dollars and putting them into his account, just as Zelensky and his friends are doing in Cypriot banks or Israeli banks or something else. This sort of nonsense is a is a great facade. Oh, I'm arresting Kolomoisky because he's bad. He's corrupt. That, that's sort of like uh, telling Willie Sutton, I'm going to start guarding banks. I'm, I'm no longer going to rob banks anymore. And you find Willie Sutton in all the banks. <laughs> What's he doing? Stuffing his pockets full of cash. It's a lot of nonsense. Uh, but Americans don't know the background, and there's no reason why they should. Americans are worried about what's happening where they are. They're worried about their own economic situation. That has worked to the advantage of this small minority that runs your government and runs our foreign and defense policy. They've been allowed to operate without accountability. Your, your uh, Ph.D. was in German and Russian relations, and that seems to be the heart of so much of American foreign policy in that region is to make sure Germany and Russia never get connected and allied in any deep way. Uh, what's going on in Germany from what you can tell? Are you starting to see any indication that the Germans have a backbone to start telling D.C. Uh, stop sacrificing us, or are they completely demoralized still and uh, going to go along with whatever we want? I think the Germans have the national consciousness of a traumatized rape victim. And uh, that's something that needs to be put aside. I think that the Germans, every time they, they feel as though they should stand up for themselves or defend their interests, uh, immediately punish themselves and beat themselves over the head and say, you can do nothing. You must sacrifice yourself. 
because of what happened 80, 90 years ago. This is nonsense, but it's been exploited by these globalist elites that currently dominate Berlin. Now, Germany's on a suicide path. They're, they're on the road to deindustrialization. Here's one of the greatest scientific industrial bases in the world with some of the best human capital in the world that operates as an engine of prosperity, not just for itself, but for Europe. They're tired, I think, in many cases of being the sort of milk cow for everyone, for effectively bailing everyone out financially when anything's gone wrong. You take Germany out of the euro zone, there's no euro. You take Germany out of the EU, there's no EU. Germans understand that. They've tried to bend over backwards to make everyone happy, and what's their thanks and gratitude? In most cases, people pour buckets and filth, uh, buckets of filth and abuse all over their heads. You know, everybody in Europe that is not German wants to blame the Germans for their problems, which is nonsense. Now, the Germans over the previous 300 years, with the exception of two brief periods, World War I and World War II, have actually had excellent relations be between themselves and the Russians. They're natural partners, strategic partners, for reasons of economics and finance, and also for reasons of strategy. We went ahead, and it appears that I think uh, Seymour Hersh is right, and I think he's, you know, I haven't seen the data, so I can't say with 100% certainty, but I think Seymour Hersh is effectively correct when he talks about how the Nord Stream 2 was destroyed. And Germans are beginning to say, well, if this is true and Seymour Hersh is right, why would our closest ally, the Americans, with whom we've had good relations ever since the end of the Second World War, really, why, why would they do this to us? And Germans are now beginning to ask whether or not they're really a sovereign country. And there's a lot of evidence that the Germans continue to behave as a vassal state of greater America. This is not going to last, David. It's going to blow up on our faces. It's going to blow up in the faces of the people in Berlin. But not until things get worse. And here's a, here's a big message for everybody. It's going to get a lot worse in Germany. If we have the cold winter everybody is forecasting, it's going to be hell to pay in that country. You would already have millions of homeless. Now you have millions of more unwanted migrants, this time millions coming out of Eastern Europe or Ukraine. Uh, add those to the millions of Muslim migrants that were never asked for and never wanted, but Germany stolidly agreed to take them in because everyone was afraid of being called a Nazi if they didn't. That, that's about to end. And I'm afraid that when it finally ends, we're going to discover that we have very few friends left in Germany.